You know that there's a new edition, African edition of On the Post Colony, which has just come out. Um, and he tells me he's got another book which is um, about to be published called The Critique of Black Reason, uh, which is um, a translation from a French from a, from a French version, which came out a couple of years ago now, I think. Um, 1913. Yeah. 1913. <laughs> my students tell me I'm stuck in another century. This explains it all. Um, apart from being a, a major intellectual, um, I should remember his uh, public intervention. In other words, he makes interventions um, on issues of uh, topical concern. And he's been doing it now as we go out to South Africa for quite some time. And the title of his talk today is, of course, extremely topical, because it's called Decolonizing the University. Up now, question mark. And I think this is an issue which concerns us all here, um, especially after uh, the organizing of the students in the Black Student Movement. So, uh, Welcome, Ashir. It's nice to have you back. Um, this time we decided to not leave him on his own, but to give him some company. Um, so we've asked Dr. No Dr. Nomalanda, who is also a public intellectual, to, to, to respond. And you all know her, so you know I don't need to introduce her to you. She's one of our own. Please forgive me, I have a few, so I'm not, not too coherent. Um, but uh, uh, when he gets his paper, <laughs> <laughs> Professor Bradley will speak for 15 minutes, and uh, Nomalanda will then speak for Nomalanda will then speak for 10, five to 10 minutes. Okay, uh, we all have to be out apparently at 6:30 uh, because there was some kind of mix-up in the booking. Um, so maybe we can start. You can start. You can start. Okay. Sorry. Uh, first of all, I, uh, I'm very happy to be back, and of course I, I will come back if I were, I were invited again. Uh, uh, I would like to, to thank Michael, uh, uh, Uhuru Institute, and uh, uh, other colleagues uh, who work, work from here. I would also like to recognize the Malanga. Uh, whose uh, columns are, are read uh, regularly. And in fact, the latest one, uh, the one that appeared last week, uh, dealt precisely with uh, uh, the issues we'll be uh, examining tonight. <coughs> when it comes to questions of transformation of uh, South African universities, it seems to me that some kind of uh, consensus, uh, we can call it weak or strong, but in any case, some kind of consensus is, is finally emerging. What I mean by consensus is a set of uh, propositions. Uh, almost every reasonable uh, person who intervenes on these matters uh, seems to uh, agree with. Whatever the historical and regional specificities uh, of the institutions we belong to, uh, whatever they are, it seems to me that there are at least seven key areas that uh, require immediate action. And a lot of people now recognize that. What are these uh, seven areas? The first has to do with the um, mobilization of, of funds to diversify our institutions through a new cycle of appointments, especially of black scholars. <coughs> Which means that transformation will not come cheap, cheaply. It costs money and uh, universities <coughs> as well as other institutions have to mobilize funds 
to write off this necessary effort. It would be uh, better if this was done, of course, within a renewed uh, effort by our government, but also the business sector, effort to recapitalize our universities. South African universities are in need of recapitalization, a recapitalization that would attend to uh, the needs uh, in terms of infrastructure expansion, but also in terms of uh, a broader project of redistribution of intelligence, which implies the recruitment of a new generation of black scholars. So that's the first area. We won't transform our universities without an injection of new powerful blood, in this case, black blood. The second area where there is <clears throat> consensus that is emerging has to do with the creation of an enabling environment for promotions for staff already in the system. Since uh, the Rose Must Fall movement began, uh, examples of two universities, Vids University and then at UCT, they have suddenly discovered that in fact, there are black scholars who have been in those universities for a number of years, who should have been promoted long ago. They were not promoted, not necessarily because the universities didn't want them to be promoted. There were all kinds of uh, obstacles that stood in face of their being promoted, some of which were as trivial as not having the required information. So the idea is therefore to create an environment where information circulates, people who are already in and who uh, uh, merit to be promoted should be promoted. And as I told you, this is already happening, at least in some institutions. The third uh, extremely important area is about a mandatory curriculum reform in every school and in every department and in every discipline. We could spend a whole week just working on what curriculum reform might entail. And I'll touch upon that uh, a bit later uh, during the, uh, the presentation. But what is clear is that we cannot go on with the types of curricula with which we have been working. They are institutions where we are peddling knowledges that are uh, have passed by their sale date. <coughs> we are teaching things that should be decommissioned, if, if you want. They should have been decommissioned long ago. So uh, curriculum reform must address that, that question. How come 20 years after liberation, we keep teaching things which are out of date? So they should be recalled. Just like you recall a faulty car uh, when it doesn't work. But curriculum reform also implies a reform in the way in which we teach. We cannot go on teaching exactly the way we have been teaching all along. For all kinds of reasons. We are dealing with a younger generation of people, most of whom Think with images, for instance. So we have to renew ways of teaching. We have to turn classrooms into laboratories, into studios, where a huge part of our effort is to learn together, where teamwork is encouraged where the purpose of teaching is about opening up all the minds in the classroom 
to that which we do not know about. So for me, curriculum reform goes hand in hand with a deep pedagogical reform, which has to attend to the uh, obstacles and, and, and dead ends uh, that have accumulated uh, over, over, the, over the years. The fourth area where um, consensus is emerging has to do with student admission policy. <laughs> student admission policy with the goal of establishing a balance between demographic diversity and cosmopolitanism. Or if you want, Afropolitanism. But let's use cosmopolitanism. And this, once again, for all kinds of reasons. We, we have to do this, first of all, because the number of young South African students who would like to go to universities has been increasing over the last 10, 15 years. The number of those who are admitted in universities, let's say that the number of places in universities has not been increasing that much. Every year in Johannesburg, for instance, you have thousands and thousands of young people who are rejected, not necessarily because they don't qualify, but because we don't have enough space for everybody. So we have to open up our universities. We have to create new universities where necessary in order to attend to an increasing demand. And the demand will keep increasing. It won't be decreasing in the coming years. But we have to do all of this within a broader framework in which we are witnessing worldwide a denationalization of higher education institutions. So we cannot be going nationalistic or chauvinistic or xenophobic when it comes to the project of higher education. So here too, some kind of consensus seems to be emerging. It is fragile, but the idea is making inroads in more than one month. The same applies to residences, for instance. At Vitz University, we have more or less 30,000 students. We have a little less than 6,000 beds. All the rest of the students live wherever they can. All the studies that have been done show that students living in residences perform better than those who do not live in residences. So very clearly, we have to raise the number of beds in our institution. But the other thing is that of the little more than 5,600 uh, students who live in residences, less than 2% are white. And this is not acceptable. If what we want to build is an inclusive, cosmopolitan society, <coughs> it has to be changed. So you have a big debate at, at Vitz University on precisely how do we transform not only residences, how do we build them? Uh, with what kind of structures do we want to build and how do we want them to, to be operating? As laboratories of a world that is diverse, that is plural, that is a world of exchanges and communication rather than a world of segregation. The fifth area has to do with the transformation of our institutional culture. And when we say culture, we mean culture in the most sophisticated sense. 
as a capacity to see in the other's face my own face. I could give you plenty of examples on the question of culture, a sensitivity to cultural dispositions, whether one has to do with interviews, whether one has to do with uh, the relationship to authority, the fact that a number of black students do not relate to the authority in the same way as white students. And that we have to be sensitive to all of this. So when we say institutional culture, we are talking of minutia as nano as, as this. Now, you have a black student who comes to see you. He will not look at you in the eyes. Because looking at an individual who is older than you in the eyes has a different meaning depending on where one, one is coming from. And I cannot take it as a defi deficiency in his mental or intellectual dispositions. There are many, many uh, uh, such details which have to be worked out so that everybody feels at home within the institution. And some people are not placed in a position where they have to ape something they don't understand in order to, to be tolerated, not even to be admitted. And the same goes on with small questions like pronouncing someone's name. That you have some people whose names are mispronounced constantly, and others who expect their names to be pronounced properly. So all of those things have to be put on the table. And for this to happen, a set of attitudes and dispositions have to, 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 to be changed. So the sixth area is about a proactive approach to institutional naming. I was asking Michael on our way here, so what's going on with the name Rhodes University? And uh, apparently, okay, a good commission is looking into, into that matter. <laughs> Let's just hope that once the commission has, has dealt with it, the matter won't be referred to yet another commission. <laughs> because we know very well how commissions uh, work. But we cannot go on with names that are, some names have to be decommissioned. It is a matter of common sense. It's no more than that. A matter of common sense. The seventh area is about language policy. A language policy that develops staff and student competence <coughs> in African languages and renews the way we approach knowledge as such. You see, we have to make people who are monolingual, we have to raise the cost, the price of monolingualism, if you will. We have to raise it. Anyone who only speaks one language, we have to make it difficult for them. <laughs> but, yeah. but that's the punitive approach. Let's put it positively. We have to create <laughs> we have to create structures of incentives for people to feel really hip in speaking many different languages and learning them because a mastery of many different languages is a bonus in the project of knowledge acquisition and dissemination. 
So let's put it in a less punitive manner. But monolingualism rhymes with colonialism. <laughs> and we have to stop that. I see you are uh, uh, clapping. Uh, we'll see when I say something you don't agree with. <laughs> so, look, we could go on and on uh, in eliciting some of these areas. Uh, you see very clearly, uh, let's say, the, the, what the horizon is, what the new project of higher education, the foundations on which it, it should stand. But it seems to me that we also have to ask ourselves, why are these questions being raised now? What is there in the now, in our now, that makes it impossible any longer to avoid these kinds of questions? Whether we call them questions of transformation or, as is more and more the case, questions of decolonization. So I would like to spend some time trying to elicit the features of that moment that forces us, with the younger generations, to confront these issues which, by the way, should have been solved long ago. Why is it that we are wasting energy, passion, and intelligence dealing with questions that should have been resolved. So, in this sense, it seems to me that over the last few years, we have been witnessing a series of not so ordinary occurrences in, in South Africa. Things, things we thought could never happen here or could never happen here again, but which are happening. Repeated incidents, uh, controversies, even heartbreaking events such as the, uh, the killing of minors in Marikana. Uh, on Sunday, we, we'll be remembering uh, what happened there, which was not so much a uh, massacre as it was in, what happened there is a potential realm of extrajudicial executions. People who are executed by the organs of the state outside of any judicial mechanism. That is what is called extrajudicial executions. So things like that which contrast with the optimism of the first decade of, of democracy things which have led a number of rather cautious observers to conclude that South Africa might be now reaching the kind of negative moment uh, Franz Fanon uh, so vividly uh, describes in his uh, famous chapter, uh, Pitfalls of National Consciousness in the Region of the Youth. I'm sure that uh, Richard, who was speaking this afternoon on, on Fanon, uh, probably alluded to this. So how is it that we recognize a quote-unquote negative moment in the Fanonian sense? First, it is a moment which usually refers to a, a kind of temporal threshold, usually 20, 25 years after liberation, a moment when new generations that have not been part of the, uh, the tribulations of the past, when these new generations begin emerging in the social scene, when, when new antagonisms and with them new social protagonists emerge while old ones remain and resolve. So you have a, a phenomenon of piling up Things that were there in need of resolution have not been resolved, and new ones are piling up with new actors, people with no living memory of uh, 
what happened earlier on, but with a vivid memory of what is actually going on now. All of which is leading to a kind of, if not saturation, cultural saturation, uh, at least uh, a potential for some serious collisions, generational collisions, but also a powerful cultural collision. So in the Fanonian sense, that is the kind of uh, paradoxical moment that comes in the aftermath of decolonization, usually 20 years later, forced by all kinds of uh, factors, some of them economic, some of them national, others global, and so forth and so on. So second, it is a moment when then contradictory forces, inchoate, fragmented, are at work and they start pulling in different directions simultaneously. And what might come out of uh, uh, all of this, this interaction, is anything but clear. Nobody can say what will come out of this. So it's a moment of dramatic uncertainty when people expect something to happen that might not happen, or it might, nobody knows. Or if it does, it usually happens in a way nobody has foreseen. <coughs> so, it seems to me that this is precisely the moment South Africa is at. What is the case, it looks as if the project that has carried us forward since 1994, that of a constitutional democracy, seems to be running out of steam. And we are struggling to find a way of repurposing it for what appears more and more as an entirely new predicament. And the signs of the product running out of steam, they are all over the place too. For those of you who read the news, you just have to read the news, you just find them all over the place. And the decolonization movement is emerging within that context, when something seems to be stuck. And the question is, how is it that we unstuck it? Now, why is it that this project is running out of steam? That is, it's running out of steam is not simply a generational problem. If you go to parliament, you talk to ANC MPs, what do you think of the EFA? They tell you, oh, these are young people. Meaning, it's a generational problem. It's partly that, but not entirely. It is a profoundly cultural question. It is a profoundly cultural question because for the last 20 years, politics in South Africa, or let's say official politics, Government politics has been about numbers. It has been about quantities. How many jobs? How many of this? How many of that? You listen to the State of the Nation address, something I do quite religiously, and my wife keeps asking, but why are you wasting your time listening to this? I just I don't want to know what's going on. I keep hoping that something else will come. But what you have all the time is a laundry list. A laundry list of this, 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 and that. Questions of numbers. <coughs> Quantities. The serious question is whether we can redress the injuries of our apartheid with numbers. What is this project that pretends to reform a profoundly injured society with numbers alone. How is it that we are making a mistake about what apartheid was all about? It was about more than just numbers. It injured everyone of the human senses for both blacks and whites. 
It acted through shock work. It changed the human sensorium from being a mode of being in touch, it turned the human sensorium into a mode of blocking out reality. Its aim was to paralyze imagination. Imagination as a political and a cultural and intellectual resource. But more importantly, it attempted to replace memory by Repetition. Now, when we use the term repetition, we usually mean the return of the same and of the identical. I mentioned Fanon. Let me mention him again because he has something to say about that principle of repetition. Fanon thought that repetition was a huge threat to the newly decolonized nation. He defined repetition as, I quote him, that, that which constitutes itself only by disguising itself. It was uh, that which was formed from one mask to another, the mask hiding nothing except other masks. That liberation is Therefore, the entry into the age of masks, masks which hide nothing except other masks, the principle of repetition, the law of repetition. Which doesn't mean that nothing has changed. But what has changed, has changed from within a law of the same, law of repetition. And of course, he didn't consider it as a positive principle. And in order to stop repeating, he believed that the whole social structure had to change from the bottom up. Difference, making a difference, uh, becoming therefore not an accident, but a reflexive substantive practice, actively willed and called for a categorical uh, reversal in the sense that it opened up the possibility of a totally new concept. Clearly, if the project that has carried us since 1994 is running out of steam, it means that we haven't followed this Fanonian lesson. The end of apartheid has not paved the way for that world of pure intensities he was dreaming of. Rather, I suggest that a most materialistic moment has succeeded to the apartheid moment. That's why our leaders are preoccupied with numbers and quantities. We live today in a place where materialism is taken for the mind. That we have undergone a reversal we take matter to be the mind. Consumption has become the core of the country's nervous system. That what has happened is a transition from a society of control to a society of consumption. So for many, to consume has become the source of all stimuli. And consumption can be said to be the quintessential form, quintessential form in the aftermath of apartheid, the, the democratic dispensation's dream world. What is that we dream about? We dream about objects. Objects have become our new comrades. It is what nowadays sets the entire body politic vibrating. And this is a profoundly cultural question, in addition to being an economic question. So that's one reason why 
we are witnessing what we are witnessing. The other reason has to do with the fact that many people, although former citizens, are feeling as if they are being treated as foreigners. They are struggling to distinguish themselves from quote-unquote foreigners. They are calling for tougher demarcations between those who belong and those who do not belong, those who are in and those who are out. It's something uh, for those of us who have been living here since uh, let's say in the last 20 years, it's something that has become more and more manifest over the last, I would say, 10 years. It wasn't here during the 10 years, the first 10 years of democracy. Why is it that people are calling for firmer demarcations between citizens and foreigners? It's because they have the feeling that the doors are fast closing, and those who won't be able to get in might be left out for generations to come, and they do not want to be left out. So what we are witnessing is a kind of social stampede, a rush to get in before it gets too late. Because after the euphoria of openness in the mid-90s, we have now entered a period of closure which, as I said, in the post-colonial uh, framework, usually occurs 20, 25 years after formal decolonization. So what is new is that many people are now willing to risk a fight. They are willing to risk a fight. They are willing to articulate a set of voices of what could be legitimate resistance at a time when a new class of beneficiaries is in the making. The term beneficiary is a term we use a lot in our vocabulary. Usually, it refers to all beneficiaries, those of our party. What I'm suggesting is that the landscape is changing, that 20 years, according to Fanon, is enough to see the emergence of a new class of beneficiaries that is added to the old class of beneficiaries that we have now a class of the beneficiaries of the transition. And that if we want to do a proper political economy of our times, we have to take it seriously that there's a new class of beneficiaries, the beneficiaries of the transition, and that as a consequence of this, the so-called black community is being fractured. That we have fractions of, of classes, if, if you want. A fraction of a class is a concept we have to rehabilitate and start working with. Now there are some black people whose interest is to see to it that, let me take a trivial example, the name Rose University is maintained. When the Rose Movement, Rose Must Fall, started in, in, at UCT, some of the most vitriolic critiques of the movement were black commentators. Why or is it the case? It's because of the fractioning we are beginning to see within, let's say, quote unquote, the black community, between the beneficiaries of the transition and those whom I have suggested are now embroiled in a social stampede because they understand very well that if they don't get in, they will be left out for a very long time. And, and, and unfortunately, they believe that in order to get, it, get in, they have to distinguish themselves firm, firmly from foreigners, because it is understood that foreigners, in any case, they are dispensable. And they don't want to be dispensable. So all of this is taking place in the midst of a triple escalation, an escalation of inequalities, we have become the most unequal society on earth. 
We're not saying in Africa. We're not saying among emerging nations. On the planet, we are the most unequal society on the planet. That's quite a serious event. So, escalation of inequalities, escalation of the struggle for voice and recognition, that paradoxically, 20 years of democracy have not resulted in every single voice being listened to. So people are struggling to articulate a voice and to be recognized. Especially among the poor. And third escalation, escalation of anger. That people have, I mean, have not been as angry as, as now. That levels of anger have extremely uh, increased. So, in that context, many are now contemplating the possibility of obtaining recognition not through, quote unquote, due process, but by burning tires, and if necessary, by arrogating to themselves the right to kill someone. So the question of processes, that's why it's so amusing. I mean, you go to parliament, people want to be recognized, say, oh, due process. Same thing at UCT, due process, rationality, all those good, uh, important <laughs> legacies uh, of, of the Enlightenment. But it misses the mark that the time is the time of affect. Affect is now trumping over due process and all those mechanics impersonalized and, 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 and very individualistic. So what we're seeing is the emergence of a constituency or a broad category of people who are simultaneously victims and perpetrators, violated and violent. And the emergence of this new category of people who are simultaneously perpetrators and victims poor and predators is rendering the task of making a, a clear distinction between what is a legitimate fight and what is an illegitimate one extremely difficult. And you see it in the case of Marikana, for instance. I was reading the, the big report, uh, hundreds of pages. And the report keeps coming back to the fact that the police killed 34 minors. But that other minors, I can't remember the exact number, other minors were also killed by other minors. So you have a situation where people are victimized, but they are also victimizing. And it makes it really difficult to define what is a legitimate struggle and what is illegitimate, and it makes it very difficult to call for sympathy or empathy when, from a moral point of view, things become so, so murky. In any case, and let me end this uh, 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 part of the uh, presentation here. What we are witnessing is a new cultural temperament. Uh, temperament in, in which many people are saying, we are no longer going to wait. Waiting is no longer an option. And it seems to me that the cultural foundation of the decolonizing argument, that is where it lies. That waiting is no longer an option. We are entering an age of impatience. But impatience and, and, and anger as uh, the uh, affective uh, 
let's say, structures of different forms of mobilization, especially against the young people and the disenfranchised. So that is a serious cultural moment when the uh, relationship to time is changed. When the relationship to time changes, it means that the relationship to memory is also changing. If indeed waiting is no longer an option, and if the time is the time of the now, the time of acceleration, then a relationship to a statue like Rhodes on the UCT campus, of course you understand that people won't get rid of it. Because their relationship to memory has a transformed in time. So that is, for me, the context. Now, the content. What is it that we mean by decolonization? Of course, calls to decolonize are not new, nor have they gone uncontested whenever they have been made. <coughs> is decolonization the same as Africanization. Is to decolonize, is it the same thing as to Africanize? Um, here, let me refer to two uh, thinkers who have precisely tried to answer that question. First of all, Fanon, and then second, Ngugi Wathiongo. Ngugi Wathiongo is, uh, uh, for those of you who are wondering who, who is he, he is a Kenyan author uh, who wrote a lot, uh, uh, a lot of books, one of which is called Decolonizing the Mind. So if you take Fanon, for Fanon, decolonization is not at all the same thing as Africanization. In fact, he is very suspicious of Africanization. He develops an entire critique of Africanization, uh, which he understands as a project of uh, the post-colonial middle class. And he did not trust the middle class, the post-colonial middle class at all. As you know, we are now in an age when the middle class is, is Lord Everybody, we live in the euphoria of the middle class, the new black middle class. Uh, if you talk to uh, some of the major investors, th those people who really traffic with huge amounts of money, investment bankers, uh, insurance, global institutions, and you ask them, oh, what's going on in Africa? The big thing is the rise of the middle class, which they perceive as the linchpin for the salvation of the continent. Salvation of the continent understood as the uh, constitution of a large market for consumers. So Fanon was uh, not at all in favor of this class. He thought that it was lazy, uh, lazy, it was unscrupulous, it was parasitic, it was lacking what he called spiritual death. Why? Because it had assimilated, I quote him, colonialist thought in its most corrupt form. Uh, he understood that these were people who were not engaged in production. They were not engaged in invention. They didn't build anything. They didn't respect labor. Um, their project was merely, I quote again, to keep in the running and be part of the racket. And for them, the Africanization of the economy basically meant uh, the transfer into native hands of those unfair advantages which were a legacy of the colonial past. Meaning that the, the project of liberation had all along really been 
to simply live like white people. That, that when you look into it, uh, it was nothing but the desire to live like whites. He didn't go beyond that. And, and he keeps coming back to that point, uh, both in the first chapter of uh, The Rest of the Earth and in that chapter on pitfalls of national consciousness. So the question that is maybe not as explicit as it should be, but which is rising from certain sections of South African society today is whether it really it was all about this. So scandals like in Kandala and the rest, people are asking, is it really what it was all about? So he also, Fano, uh, thought that Africanization was fundamentally xenophobic. Uh, and in fact, uh, the dark desire to get rid of the foreigner uh, is uh, the, especially the fellow African from another nation. Uh, Fanon saw it uh, as the name of an inverted racism, uh, self-racism, if you will. So his idea of decolonization was about the creation of new forms of life, uh, the end of uh, mimicking Europe, um, the uh, end of repetition, and the institution of a difference that would uh, uh, allow for the possibility to reconstitute the human after humanism complicity with uh, colonial racism. When you take Ngugi, with Ngugi, to decolonize means to see oneself clearly. And that's his definition, seeing oneself clearly. And for him, decolonization was part of a larger politics, not of racketeering and looting, but the politics of what he called the mother tongue, the politics of language. Um, the politics of language in uh, uh, a broader context of a continent that was uh, constantly in relation with uh, its elsewhere, its uh, diasporas. He believes also that uh, decolonization was not an end point. It was the beginning of uh, an entirely new struggle over what is to be taught, the terms under which we should be teaching, not to some generic figure of the student, but to the African child, I quote him, a figure that is very much central to Ngugi's politics and his creative work. Ngugi keeps coming back to the figure of the child, um, much more than any other African writer. The child is at the center of his politics and of his creative work. So to educate, to teach, to reform the university, or education has to be done in relation to the child. The child, uh, in Ngugi's thought, um, representing um, that form of the human person who has not asked to be there, but who is there. The child also representing a certain idea of futurity, uh, the future. Um, of a legacy, of a certain kind of debt between generations. So it's interesting that for him, decolonization has to do with the future of the child and what he calls the, the African child. We could go on and on on this. Uh, decolonization for him is also about uh, re recentering. What is the center? The center is Africa. The center is not the offshore. That the offshore model of the university doesn't make sense. The center is the African continent. 
And uh, the, the offshore model like UCT, I don't want to uh, add rules on, onto that. Oh. But that, whether you are an offshore university, it's up to you to, 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 to say it. But that the offshore model cannot work from within these uh, decolonizing perspective a la Ngugi. Ngugi was also convinced that the African University of tomorrow will be multilingual and that its geographical imagination will extend well beyond the confines of the nation state. And what we have to build is not a South African university, it's an African university, Africa understood as part of the history of the world at large. But there is not one single aspect of the history of the world that has not an African dimension, and, and vice versa. So that geographical imagination should be the basis of the project of decolonizing the university. And the implications are enormous in terms of policy. We don't have the time to go through that because Noalanga has to, we have to listen to her. But the implication <laughs> of, of what it denationalized, denationalized South African university would be are immense. It would mean, for instance, opening up our borders. There's, there's the silliness, pure silliness of recent visa legislation. It does not make any sense. Nor for South Africa's own interests, let alone uh, the rest. It's like you take a gun, you look at your feet, and you shoot at yourself. <laughs> and then you stand up and pretend to argue, why is it that that's, that's a good thing to do? <laughs> or you try to stand up, <laughs> you, provided that you have really shot yourself <laughs> properly. <laughs> so it doesn't make sense. For instance, you take what's going on in Asia. The Chinese are willing to learn English. They have money to pay for learning English. They go and learn English in the Philippines. 600,000 students of English in the Philippines every single year. Billions of dollars involved in it. Why should there be a center where people come to learn English and other African languages. Why don't we use the existence of a very serious, strong, diasporic community of scholars in the rest of the world and do what the Chinese are doing? Create mechanisms whereby people can come temporarily, work with us, and then go. Because that's how the world works today. You had a visitor here the other day, Wamba Dia Wamba, who is one of the uh, most important thinkers in Africa right now. For him to come here, he has to undergo all the hurdles, visas and all of that. Why do we create obstacles to our own emancipation? Where things could be easily done and beneficial not only for South Africa, but for the continent at large, so that we recapture what is the essence of the project of decolonization to turn Africa in its own center. So I'll leave you with that uh, question. How is it that we turn our own continent into its own center? One of my suggestions is by opening it up to itself. Not by recreating offshore entities that do not account neither to our history nor to our future. So the project of turning the continent once again into its own center, such is the ultimate meaning of decolonization. And it forces us to reimagine or what the dynamics of circulation might be. 
Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, let me start where he left off to turn the continent into its own center. One of the challenges that uh, Dr. Baba Ramakwana put to us uh, two years ago at an Africanization seminar here at Rhodes University was to define the attributes of an African graduate. And um, I think that we cannot talk about um, decolonization if we are not thinking of it as a regenerative and creative process. So who or what is this African graduate? And when I was at WITS with you um, in May, I wrote this down hurriedly on a piece of paper. Uh, it came to me in the moment. This is the kind of graduate we are trying to produce and we can tinker with this definition. An African graduate is well versed in the critical intellectual traditions of the African continent and the diaspora regardless of their disciplinary training. They are multi-idiomatic in language and literary culture. They are rigorous in disciplinary training, pan-African in their problem solving, and global in their technological competencies. That is the graduate that we should be striving to produce. I'll repeat this uh, at, at the end of my little seven minute segment. Now, let's let me talk about this project that has run out of steam, this 1994 consensus that so clearly is up in flames, that is so clearly now post-Mandela. It has been quite clear in South Africa that um, what we see in Parliament is a reflection of this kind of um, sort of uh, rupture that uh, Professor Mbembe has uh, sort of described in the opening uh, parts of his talk. I want to state that I think that that rupture is very deeply reflected in the universities, except that there's a hypocrisy in the universities for a lack of a will to identify that rupture. So I want to talk about the university in South Africa currently as an intellectual infrastructure that has run out of steam. A university project that is entangled in knots and contradictions and an inability to figure out its own purpose and direction. And when it does, it adopts the offshore model because that makes the money, that fits into the global um, sort of corporatization of knowledge, commodification of knowledge system that is on the rise. What do we have then in our universities? What is this intellectual project that has run out of steam? I'll talk about it in two senses. One, in the colony that is Rose University, oh well, no, in the colony currently known as Rose University, <laughs> there is the pretense of an intellectual culture, yes. but the real reality is the comfort of a career. Looking forward to a humble pension fund through Alexandra Forbes. <laughs> that on the one hand, you can take that and extend it to all our universities. A kind, of an, uh, a kind of a pretense, a performance, at some kind of intellectual engagement, at some kind of um, scholarly endeavor. But really what we're doing is churning out knowledge uh, for select audience of ourselves, echoing each other, publishing for the sake of a career, credits for the sake of credits, profile for the sake of profile, and just um, enjoying being called Dr. Nomalangam Kiza for no other reason except for the fact that you got a PhD. That is on the one hand. The pretense, however, I would like to argue, is also quite deep for black, scholars in particular. Um, there is a tendency to produce a particular type of black scholar today within not just the South African university, but the African university as, as a whole. And that is to produce the scholar of policy studies and recommendations. The scholar of policy studies and recommendation is caught up in the aid industrial funding donor complex this is the scholar who has to produce because actually our people are hungry at home. So we have got to make some money. Let us be clear. 
Yes, the scholar will arrive in the colonies currently known as UCT or Rhodes University, maybe Stellenbosch. And they will arrive and they will be the token African in the room and therefore inhabit the space of appearing to be conducting intellectual activity, but they are not. So we have a problem of a black scholarship that is, has deteriorated severely. And then the students throw poo on a statue, tell people this is not good enough, and a generation of elders is confused. I will not, because I've only got like three minutes left, I will not go over the seven areas, but um, I particularly uh, was struck by this notion of white flight in the Wits University residence system. This question of infrastructure, how to understand the physicalness, the, phys the physical uh, sense, the physicality of a university, how it is to be built, how it is to be inhabited, how it is to um, even uh, create a sense of logical um, t uh, architecture in the context of our cities, uh, in the context of our continent. Eden Grove, no sun comes through, okay? Because we are still as universities even quite unable to, even at, in the minutiae of the logic of our own infrastructure, to think about the fact that we are on the African continent. It's like a swear word to say we're on the African continent, even though it's got very practical ramifications, such as how you build. I want to talk about culture. You spoke about a sophisticated way of looking at culture, and I particularly enjoyed this. I want to talk, and you spoke about um, the way in which the affect has, has, has come to the fore. The sense that uh, there is no longer um, a patience, that the new cultural temp temperament is one where waiting is no longer an option. I just want to flag in the colony, and in colonies like one currently known as Rhodes University, how institutional culture definitely lies in the minutiae, in microaggressions of white normativity in the little things that pinch and bite your black self such that you become a fugitive of your own self in this space. So decolonization, talking about institutional culture, talking about transformation is about those little things that pinch at you daily on your skin. I want to problematize very quickly two things that you mentioned, or not so much problematize, but put questions forward and have us think more about them. One is the notion of the beneficiaries of the transition and the fracturing of the black community. It's quite interesting that the biggest supporters of the EFF at least the most vocal that we see in the newspapers, are usually the middle class, the black middle class. Not entirely, but its very biggest proponents uh, and its leadership have very much largely been drawn from the black middle class. Now the black middle class, in many ways, has become schizophrenic, unsure of whether it has benefited or not, as it watches um, itself being pinched in the institutions into which it is supposedly has benefited by entering, and also being pinched by an economy which still demands that the black middle class consider itself economically linked to where it has supposedly delinked, i.e. home, the township, the rural area. If not that, some broader black community that still requires income. I'm not here saying there is no black middle class, but there are questions. And while we discuss beneficiaries, to remember that the biggest beneficiaries of those transitions have in fact been white South Africans. I want to address one last thing and then wrap up with Ngugi and the figure of the child. I want to problematize, not problematize in fact, I want to underscore the necessity of denationalizing the South African university in order to pursue a pan-African project. But I want to flag, or I want to put up a red robot around the way in which 
xenophobia is increasingly becoming a discourse of escape for transformation in which black South Africans are pitted against black so-called foreigners. Where we find that, in fact, the universities that are the least transformed are the ones with the least Africans, and the ones that are the most transformed are the ones with the most Africans, and then the cries of xenophobia arise from the white universities, where you have a history department in a certain white university that I will not name, where 90% of the staff are white men, males, and then there's a question about how equity candidates might be pitted against black South African equity candidates might be pitted against black African candidates when they should just get rid of the white men. <laughs> we need to be very careful because I'm very much hearing the discourse of pitting black against black all over again in, 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 in South Africa as a springboard to resist transformation, not to advance it. And I would like to close by talking about Ngugi, because I think I'm a Ngugian. It has become quite clear this year, for first years at least. <laughs> I, uh, I, am not mon I am not a uh, friend of monolingualism. But I want to talk about the figure of the child and to argue that it is in the figure of the child that we find our most creative impulse. Because it is when you look at the African child, whichever African child, the African child, and you ask, what world do I want to create? And so when we want to move, <laughs> oh, there's my African child. Hi, <laughs> man. Well, look, Baba, when I'm acted. On cue, on cue. I'm acted. Sorry. OK, <laughs> sorry. OK, well, now she's disrupted me. OK, she's, she's sick. Um, it is in the figure of the child that we think about futurity. And what I and my little community, and here I'm not saying the black people community, I mean my immediate space of artists and creators, what we do is we write books. We can't wait for white people to write the books. We can't wait for white people to write the stories for the children. The creative impulse, I think, begins with futurity. Well, does that work out? <laughs> OK, I think, that, I think that's a nice way to end. <laughs> I didn't see that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Nomaranga. I think that even if you had planned it, it I didn't. <laughs> it wouldn't have worked. <laughs>